well, at least seventh graders anyways, and then I realized something this morning. When you teach seventh grade, really at any given time, there's only, I don't know, two or three people that are actually listening and paying attention to you. And you guys, well, maybe you're not paying attention, but you sure look at... Um, so uh, if you would, uh, feel free to blurt things out at random, uh, maybe even throw things. Uh, you'll have to pick them up later. And I'll feel much more comfortable about speaking up here. Am I a little, a little close? Okay. All right, I'll start from my notes. Um, th this will help me as I'll uh, hopefully keep my time a little closer to what I was hoping. Um, good morning, my name is Chris McIntyre, and I'm a seventh grade science teacher. I'm also uh, a father of three children, um, a husband of 16 years to my wife, Joanna, and uh, <clears throat> unfortunately, that's how we often refer to ourselves. I'd really prefer to be best known as a devoted follower of Christ. Um, you probably noticed something as uh, listed here. Uh, I lack something that most people up at this pulpit have, uh, ministry credentials. Uh, my credentials are in science education. Uh, I can explain why we breathe in oxygen and exhale carbon dioxide. Um, I'm not qualified per se, to speak on God's uh, sovereignty or our free will and how that fits together. Um, however, I take comfort that uh, God chose many unqualified people in the Bible to, to do his work and show his glory through them. And so maybe I have a message today and he's chosen me, an unlikely messenger, so that you'll know that the message could only come from him and not myself. At least that's my prayer of this past week. Um, I'm here, as Greg said, to, to share the good news of Christ's work and my response to it. Um, so I probably ought to start by saying, boy, I have a really good understanding of my own sin. Um, I dress up pretty well and uh, I can, I can look the part, but let me tell you, um, I'm pretty self-serving and uh, I can have some pretty angry outbursts. So, I'm a, I'm a hostile person to a holy God. And as Greg has already mentioned, Romans 3.23 says, For all have sinned and fall short of the glory of God. In that sin, it's also very evident to me that... Um, I can't mend that relationship on my own. I try hard, I do, and I always fall short. Um, I need someone with much more power, and that person is Christ. His atoning blood restores my relationship to God, and it covers over my sin from my past, from right now, and for even tomorrow. Ephesians 1, 7 to 8 says, In him we have redemption through his blood, the forgiveness of our trespasses according to the riches of his grace, which he lavished upon us in all wisdom and insight. You see, fully understanding this redemption results in a change in my heart. Before, I was concerned only with my desires. Um, before, I was concerned only with myself. Honestly, before, I was my own God. Having been redeemed, though, um, I'm concerned with what concerns God. I uh, seek his will, and he's my master, which it says in Romans 6.22. But now that you have been set free from sin and have become slaves to God, the fruit you get leads to sanctification, and it's in eternal life. So I ask the question, then, well, what concerns God? What are his desires, and uh, what does my master call me to? And so I look to Matthew 22, 37 to 39, and Christ says this, You shall love your God with all your heart, and with all your soul, and with all your mind. This is the great and first commandment, and the second is like it. You shall love your neighbor as yourself. And so here I'll share some of my story as a testament of God's love and my response to it. 
Six years ago, my wife and I uh, were living what seemed the great life, the good life, in Colorado Springs. Um, but we could both tell you that something was lacking. Um, we were convinced convicted that the amazing redemptive work that Christ had done in our lives wasn't being translated into very redeemed lives. We were, we were lukewarm. We played the part, but our hearts at times were nowhere near. Um, but we felt that God was at work, and we felt that he wanted uh, our devotion and our obedience and so he prompted and prepared us to quit our jobs um, with very little plan um, of what would be. Um, although he had a plan. It turned out that that plan was that Joanna would get another job and um, it would allow her and I to move back to our hometown in Canyon City here. Uh, he did not provide for me um, a paying job. Um, although there was certainly work to be done. However, I was really excited in this because it meant that uh, maybe I wouldn't have to wake up to the alarm every morning and uh, I'd have a lot of me time to do things like work on this uh, home remodel that we had just gotten ourselves into. Um, however, God had more in mind, um, much greater plans. You see, my mother had been diagnosed with ALS shortly after our, uh, our move. Um, that was not what spurred the move. But in, um, in seeing that, uh, I felt that my time would be best spent uh, caring for her in her last year of life, which was uh, quite a blessing to all. Um, God eventually did provide a job for me the following year, um, though it didn't seem like anything would come up, it did. And uh, I began teaching middle school science. And I'll tell you, uh, the prior 10 years, um, I'd been uh, working uh, with youth in our church and was always drawn to high school kids and not middle school kids. Um, and I swore I'd never teach that age group, however, when that job opened up, um, not only did I have a desire for the job, I had an excitement for the kids that I can't explain. Um, the last five years have been a blessing, and I've had an opportunity to communicate value and hope to children who have neither. Um, With that job came a desire and a financial ability also to buy a rental house. Um, we felt God that, um, was preparing someone to come and live in that place and, and we trusted that he'd bring somebody and bring someone he did. Um, there was an abandoned mother and her daughter that were being, uh, were, were leaving in, NCI, which um, Alan Donald spoke um, last week who works at that ministry, and they needed a place to live. Um, and He approached us, and uh, the numbers didn't work out. Um, they were not able to pay, um, not much anyways. And in fact, every month we took a pretty significant loss, but in that, God provided. From early in our marriage, Joanna and I both had a, a desire for adoption. Um, but we didn't really know what that looked like. Um, we talked with a friend who, has, uh, who works with children in foster care, and he spoke of, of, their, of their need and, and even mentioned our possible involvement. And through prayer and uh, much counsel, we felt God was leading us to that, and maybe that was how he would use us in, a, in adoption. So we began that arduous process, and maybe you didn't know that it is an arduous process, but it is. You'd think that anyone willing to take care of these children would just, boom, we'll, we'll let you, but no. Paperwork and more paperwork and classes. Um, as we did that, we began to dream of the children that God was going to bring to us, and we, and we dreamed of small children. Um, God, again, had different plans. Um, he brought us Ariana. 
who at the time was a 10-year-old girl, 10-year-old beautiful girl, um, who had been in foster care for five years, needing a forever family for that entire time. And amazingly, God gave us a love for her that surpassed the difficulties that we had with her and still have. Um, and two years ago, we adopted her, and we're thankful for her part in our lives. As we began that foster family, we realized that we'd love Joanna's parents to live closer to us. Um, they'd moved away while we were in college and were willing to return, um, but didn't really have the means or the prompting, and so God again provided, and um, we found ourselves able to buy a, another house. Um, and it happened to be right across the street from where we were living. Um, how cool. And we planned this for them. Um, as we started planning to have them move, uh, God's plan again changed. Or our plan again changed, and was his plan was evident. Um, see, we'd had many other foster children come and go in our home, and there had been four children that were siblings that were going to be coming up for adoption, and, and we interacted with them, and, and we began to wonder if they were to be ours. And, and so our practical minds immediately went to our two-bedroom home and said, it can't happen at this place, and so, God, if you call us to this, then you'll have to provide a home, a, a much bigger home. <laughs> He had been preparing it and had one that he placed in our path that fit all criteria. Um, not only was it larger, it also had a carriage house in back. Perfect for Joanna's parents. Across the street was nice, but across the backyard, that's, that's great. Um, again, finances were provided and, he, and we made the move and, the, and Joanna's parents did as well. And, and now we enjoy helping and caring for one another every day. When we moved, we began preparing the home to accommodate these four children that we hoped to adopt. And again, our plans were not his plans, and he showed us um, that those four children were not to be ours, and they were adopted by their foster family, which we did not expect. And so we were somewhat deflated and, and began to wonder, why'd you put us in this huge house? He quickly, uh, he quickly let us know as he brought four other children to our home. Um, in addition to Ariana, we had um, a three-month-old, a six-year-old, a nine-year-old, and a 15-year-old. And you may have seen the, the, the then three-month-old who um, is an active child and uh, can't sit through, and he has since uh, gone down to the nursery. And he quickly captured our hearts. Um, his story of drugs and abuse, um, along with his smile and his sweet demeanor, uh, made us long to, to have him as our forever son as well. And uh, now, over a year later, we adopt him on June 10th. God had other plans for the other three children in our home, um, and they've since moved on, some to their families, which was good, and others to other places, but uh, all of them are still in our lives. Um, earlier this year, um, we got a call about a, a two-day-old baby with drug exposure. Um, we responded in faith, um, even though... Uh, it was going to be a difficult process. Um, he too has been a blessing. He's also not used to sitting in, you know, somewhere in the foyer up there. Um, we look forward to starting the adoption process with him in the next few months. So the sinful part of me right now would love to tell you that this story was me and that my strong convictions and my hard work and my financial planning led me to where I am, that would be a lie. Um, I credit God with any good that has come from my life. 
Um, like I mentioned before, on my own, I'm a pretty sinful, selfish individual. And so I turn back to Romans 9, 16 and 17. And it says, So then it depends not on human will or exertion, but on God who has mercy. For the scripture says to Pharaoh, For this very purpose I have raised you up, that I might show my power in you, and that my name might be proclaimed in all the earth. I believe this is true in my life. No, I'm not like Pharaoh, thankfully. Not fully, anyways. Um, but I do believe that God has placed me where I am today that he might be proclaimed to the earth. Um, he's given me Joanna in marriage, which has been pretty great. Um, not because I have needs and she has needs and fleshly desires, but because he would have me represent his love for the church and my love for her. He's given me many foster children and three adoptive children, not because they are in need of food and shelter and clothing, but because they are in need of knowing him. He's allowed me to live with my in-laws, not because I need babysitting, though I do, and not because they need my nightly meals, but that we might all know his love. He's given me three rental houses, not because I'm in need of income or because my renters are in need of lodging, but because they are in need of knowing his love. He's given me a job teaching seventh graders, not because I've sinned, or because I need the income, or because they need science education, but because they are in need of knowing his love. My redemption through Christ should flow into everything I pursue. Romans 9, 31 and 32 says, But Israel, who pursued the law that would lead to righteousness, did not succeed in reaching it, reaching that law. Why? Because they did not pursue it by faith, but as if it were based on works. They have stumbled over the stumbling stone. And then James 2, 18 is similar. But someone would say, You have faith, I have works. Show me your faith apart from your works, and I will show you my faith by my works. Faith and an understanding that God has redeemed me should result in doing good works. But the works aren't the goal. Without faith, our best works are filthy rags apart from him, and they are incapable of restoring our relationship to God. So what is this faith that keeps being mentioned? Why is it so important, and how should we respond? Um, it comes from accepting the truth that God designed us to be in relationship with him. But because of our sin, um, we are dependent on him to restore that relationship. And then reuniting us with God. Because knowing God's love makes us long for more and more to be loved and to be loved. The teacher and me would like the end to have a take-home application to all of this. I won't ask you a question as you walk out the door, but maybe I should. Although I'm the kind of person that loves check-the-box lists, steps to follow, unfortunately, that's not what I'm bringing you today. Um, you see, each of us is uniquely equipped to put our faith into action. And there's no formula to follow. And I'm sure that the way I'm doing it today will not look the same 10 years from now. Um, as we start each day, we would do well to remember that we, what we desire and plan is of much less consequence than what God might purpose to do in us and through us. Each day brings new opportunities and challenges sometimes loss, but in the end of the day, we can delight in the fact that Jesus does all things well. And he gives us the opportunity to participate with him in what he is doing in the lives of those around us. So, be bold. Step out in faith, trusting him. The more you follow him, the more you will delight in him and the more you will love him. And the more you love him,
the more you will love others. And it just gets better every day. This is the abundant life that we can have in Christ. Thank you. Thank you, Chris, for all that. It's um, wonderful to hear what the life of discipleship looks like from somebody who's not paid to do it, right? Uh, that's why I really wanted Chris to come and talk to you because he's not paid to do any of those things except teach school. So the life of a disciple can look, as he said, different in all different walks of life. And it's not just for me or for people who are paid to do it, for missionaries, but it's a call that God gives to all of us. And it will look different. And the church is here not to uh, do discipleship on your behalf, but to equip you like um, the e Free Church has equipped Chris and his family to do ministry. That's what church is for. So let's ask the praise band to come up and we'll um, conclude with a prayer. Father, we thank you for um, all the good things you're doing in, in and through the lives of your saints, people that we see in our community, people we may not even know are uh, doing anything different or radical, but have really given their lives for you in doing all sorts of ministry, responding in faith to the gifts that you've given to them. So Lord, we ask that... Uh, that as we look at ourselves and think about what gifts you've given us, what abilities we have, what opportunities we have, we would submit them all to you. We would pray and ask you to, uh, to direct us how we can use all of these things for your glory and to share the life and love of Jesus Christ. We ask all of these things in your name. Amen.